everybody. Uh, we're here for a deer management presentation. Uh, my name is Michael Lesser. I'm the chair of your conservation commission. Um, and this is part of a, uh, this is the beginning of a series where we're going to hopefully have presentations twice a year on natural resource issues that are of some interest of importance uh, to Sherborne and maybe even nearby towns. Um, I'm sort of reading a, out of order, but I'll say that this is since the beginning of one of the of this sort of series of talks that we're going to try to have, that uh, if people have ideas about other issues that are of some interest to them, please write them down or contact the Conservation Commission in some way. Um, or uh, you could write them down on a piece of paper. We're, uh, we're sending around a sign-up sheet because then uh, we'll be able to contact you directly when we come up with other presentations that are in the future. Um, so please sign up, give your name and some, some sort of email address, which would be the easiest way to get a hold of, uh, of everybody. Um, so make sure you sign up, and if you have any thoughts, you can write them there or right afterwards even uh, on the piece of paper if you have any thoughts. Um, tonight, we're dealing with uh, deer management, as you know, even with all of our time forests and everything, we have a very oversized deer population, and that's led to all sorts of issues, including their need for food goes well beyond what the forest can sustainably provide. Um, and, uh, and tonight we have our speaker, the, the speaker is David, as you see there, David Stainbrook. Um, he is your basic mass, works at Mass Division of Fish, Fisheries and Wildlife. He is the state deer biologist, as I've been told. He's been working there for six years. Um, and before that, he worked on deer issues in Pennsylvania with the Game Commission there. And I gather in graduate school, he even worked on deer issues and deer population estimation. Um, so, uh, and he's going to talk about um, he's going to talk about how the impact of the deer on our landscapes. Um, both public and, and private, as well as maybe some population estimates of what goes on here, maybe. Um, and then he's going to talk about what some other towns have been doing to manage deer issues, and then also talk about what Mass Wildlife is doing and what their recommendations are for both uh, towns and for individual landowners. Um, and we will have, there's enough time for lots of questions. Um, at the, preferably at the end, obviously, if something's a burning issue, you can interrupt them along the way, but uh, we'll try to keep some of them towards the end. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we'll see how it goes. And I think that's probably the end of my issues here. Again, please sign up and think about other issues that might be of interest to you in the future uh, for these kind of meetings. I appreciate you all coming here. And it's all yours, David. Great, thank you. Um, like you said, I've, I've been in Massachusetts for a little over six years now. Um, historically, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Historically, the, the deer biologists spent a little bit more time dealing with you know, statewide deer densities, dealing with you know, those types of issues, typically west of 495. But in the past 10 years or so, we've been dealing with more and more issues with deer and turkey and, and other wildlife um, east of 495 and so that's just you know the the I'll get into why those that we have those issues but in general it's the habitat is actually pretty good for some of these wildlife and you don't have a lot of the uh, the kind of controls in place that can allow us to, to keep those those animal numbers in in balance um, and so with that said a lot of my time over the past six years has been more and more dealing with eastern towns dealing with how can we help um, a town deal with their issues uh, with deer. First of all, do you have issues with deer? Um, if you do, what are some of the things that we can help you with? Um, and try to explain the framework that we work with in the state and uh, you know, educate the public at, at presentations like this. So happy to be here um, and you know, feel free to ask questions. I'll stick around as late as you need me to. Um, and there's additional slides that I, didn't include in, I did not include in here, but um, if, if there's a question, I can get to one of those. Um, so I'll get started. <coughs> so first off, um, our agency is responsible not just for deer, uh, we're responsible for all wildlife, all plants, you know, everything. So from your endangered, um, you know, turtles to, you know, threatened endangered plants and all the way up to really common things like turkeys and, and deer. And so there, for some of those species, it's strict protection. We need to do everything we need 
to do to protect these animals to make sure that they can thrive um, to very abundant animals like deer uh, where we have to actually lethally control them through hunting. And so, you know, this is all a balance. This is what our agency is responsible for doing. Um, to give you some idea of, of white-tailed deer and, and where they live, how big their home range is, uh, we call it a home range. That's basically everywhere they go in their life, you know, if you drew a circle around it. Um, and to, to kind of describe that, this is from my graduate work in Gettysburg National Military Park in Pennsylvania. Um, this is one of the, the deer that I had a GPS collar on, a GPS collar that would take locations um, relatively every two to four hours. Um, and so this is basically everywhere this deer was for an entire year. Um, and I believe this one was an adult female. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of, you know, a typical, you have your road, you have some of these houses here, you have a little development here, um, big block of woods, some fields. And you can see that it's not like the deer spent an equal amount of time everywhere within this area. It spent a lot of time right here, it spent a lot of time right here, right here, and right here. Um, and then occasionally would make these movements out here. And then keep in mind, this is just one deer. If we had, you know, all the deer in this area, you would see a lot of these overlapping home ranges. So they, they do overlap a lot of times. Um, in the groups, it's typically a, a female with her offspring of that year, and a lot of times her offspring from previous years if they're females. If they're males, um, usually what happens is a, a male fawn will stay with the mother until the next year, um, either before she has her new fawns or, bef you know, around that breeding season, they'll do what's called a dispersal. And about 75% of the males, when they're about a year and a half old, will move out of their natal home range, so where they were born, and, and establish a new home range. And um, that's for, you know, an evolved response so that they're not in inbreeding with their own family members. Um, and so these deer will disperse anywhere from a, a couple miles as to as far as, you know, over 20 miles. Um, and once they establish that new home range, they pretty much stay there um, for the rest of their life. So most of our adult males will pretty much stay, you know, where they've established that range. So that gives you a sense of kind of the dynamic here. So you have these groups of, um, you know, we call them matriarchal groups of a female with their offspring. And then the, the bucks typically, typically will either be solitary most of the year or they'll form these bachelor groups for most of the year. And then before the breeding season, which we're coming up to now, the uh, peak is around November, um, they'll kind of go off on their own and become territorial and uh, all that. So like I said, the, the peak of the rut is in mid-November. Um, this is also, if you were to track vehicle collisions, you tend to see a spike right around this time because you have deer that are chasing other deer. You have deer that are, you know, these bucks that are moving all over the landscape. Um, and then you have those yearlings, like I mentioned, 75% of those yearling males will disperse around that time, um, either then or the spring. And so they are now moving through landscapes they've never been before, you know, crossing big roads they've never crossed before. And um, it puts them at a huge risk of getting hit by cars. And so if you were to age every deer that gets hit on the roads in Massachusetts, you'd find a large proportion of those would be those, those yearling animals. Um, females typically give birth to one to three fawns per year. I would say on average it's about two. Um, they give birth, you know, it's basically 201 days after the peak of the rut. So it puts you into late May, um, anywhere from there to early July. The, like the, the more narrow that time frame is for a, you know, a peak of the rut into a peak of when they're uh, giving birth, you know, if they're basically able to overwhelm the predators on the landscape and put all their fawns down at one time and that you know, helps the survival of, of those fawns because they're very critical survival in the first uh, few weeks of their life. And then once they're over, you know, about eight weeks old, then they're a lot more um, able to survive. They can outrun predators at that point. Um, and that's kind of why you see um, a fawn during the first eight weeks of its life, it's going to be pretty much um, hidden and spend very little time with its mother. And so every, every um, summer I get a lot of phone calls of people that find fawns and they think it's been orphaned or abandoned. Um, and that's just natural behavior. The mothers will keep their fawns. Um, and, and even if she has two fawns, they don't stay together. Those fawns will seek separate places um, so that if one gets predated, the other one still survives. And so they, they pretty much stay still um, and rely on the fact that they don't have a lot of scent and they're not going to move to kind of allow them to get big enough so that they can eventually um, outrun those predators. And, and um, they will nurse, but it's going to be every you know, four to eight hours that the mother will come back and then they'll, you know, they'll make some little grunt noises and get back to, with each other. Um, 
And then once later in the summer, that's when you start to see does walking around with multiple fawns. Um, then they'll be pretty much with their moms all the time at that point. Um, if we were to come up with an estimate of our fawns per female, um, probably be around 1.6 to 1.8 fawns per female. Um, you know, so right around two fawns per female. Um, and then when you look at the fawns that are, that are born each year, you know, an average of two fawns, how many of them are going to survive? And so we've, there's a lot of studies out there that looked at so fawn survival. Um, and pretty much all of those, those studies found that it's about, you know, 40 to 60%. Um, so roughly half the fawns are not going to make it. And I think the most interesting thing that I found from these research studies is they're studying places where there's high predator numbers. You have bobcats, black bears, coyotes in pretty high numbers. Um, and they're studying places like in Delaware where you don't really even have, you know, some of those predators of fawns. And even in that study, they found that half the fawns didn't make it. So it's, it's, it's an interesting. It's almost like the, um, no matter what, you know, only the 50% are going to be fit enough to, to survive. Um, but even with half the fawns not making it, it's still amazing that population can continue to grow, um, and pretty exponentially in some cases. So what are they? In the spring and summer, there's a lot of food. This is the time where, you know, green up deer have a lot of food available. This year, I think, was a little bit wetter than your average year, so it, it provided a lot more um, of that, you know, green up later into the season. Um, so f some of those fields were a little bit more um, productive than typical. Um, you see here a deer eating, you know, a shrub next to what looks like a yard. I mean, a lot of times you see, you know, deer in your yard eating, and you think, oh, they must be out there eating the grass, or, you know, it's actually what they're looking for are the weeds. So we call them forbs. But it's those, those green, um, leafy, um, you know, clover, dandelion, those types of things. That's what they're selecting for. The grass, they'll occasionally eat it when it's tender, but it's, it's hard for them to digest, actually. So um, that's what you're seeing. And, uh, you know, it isn't until the fall through the winter that they start browsing on your hard, you know, saplings and, and um, shrubs. And so this is when they typically start hitting those, those different forest species that, that we want to make sure are abundant in the forest. Um, it is also when you know, all those green plants that were available throughout the summer have died back. All that they really have now are you know, the, the hard mass that comes down, you know, you're talking about, um, and soft mass. That is available for a short amount of time um, until it's cleaned up or it's covered by snow. And then they have to go back to that woody browse. Um, so most of the impacts that you're going to see to a forest take place during that time. So what does it look like? Um, so because deer don't have upper incisors, I don't know if many of you guys know that, it's just a hard pallet on top. So they're not able to, like we can, clip something. So you get this ragged edge when they, when they browse on something. Um, and I bring this up because I don't want deer to be blamed for everything. <laughs> if you see this, it's, this is not from a deer. So if it looks like somebody came by with pruning shears or, or scissors and cut a nice 45 degree angle, um, that's not deer. So that's something that, you know, rabbit or woodchuck or some other uh, type of critter that has those teeth that can make that cut. And so this is one of the things when we do go out and evaluate forest health, you know, we're making sure that what we're seeing is something that a deer actually physically ate. Um, and you can tell that based on that, that, that appearance of that browse. Um, so why do we care? Why do we care if deer numbers get really, really high in the landscape? Um, for our agency, the most important thing we, we're concerned about is we want to see that balance, um, the ecological balance to make sure that the forest appears healthy and diverse and so that all the other species that we're responsible for managing, you know, from the insect numbers to, to bird numbers, that everything is able to sustain um, and it's not going to be detriment, detrimented by the uh, overbrowsing in a forest. Um, one of the things that was interesting, some of the, the recent st studies on insect numbers and um, in pollinator species, and so deer seem to love those, those plants in the, in the forest that have flowers. Um, and, and uh, you know, as those are becoming less and less available through the years of browsing, you start to see, you know, some of the wildlife and insects that rely on those, those flowers are, you know, starting to decline in, in numbers as well. Um, some of the other things with high deer numbers, you start to have an increase in public safety risks, like vehicle collisions start to increase. Um, 
you know, that's one of the great things that I like to hear from towns is if they can get a good number on how many vehicle collisions they're getting. It can tell you a lot. You get things like property damage. Um, and from our standpoint, you know, we want to make sure that all wildlife is valued for its role in the ecosystem. And what we don't want to see is deer being treated like rats, you know, as pests. And, and they want to just call an extermination company to come, you know, remove their problem in a, in a quick way. You know, it's a valuable um, species on the landscape. There is a rule for it. And it's all about, you know, maintaining that balance. Um, so why doesn't nature just keep the balance? You know, it seems to work for chipmunks and squirrels and, and all these other critters. For squirrels this year, we had a little bit of an anomaly. The, the squirrel numbers were a little bit high this year because we had such good conditions over the past few years. So um, I'm sure you all saw <laughs> how many squirrels were out there. Um, but that's that up and down, you know, you should have enough predators on the landscape to help manage those, those species. Um, but for deer, we, it's our fault. Humans actually came through and we removed all those major predators that were here before. You know, the wolves, uh, mountain lions, you know, we, didn't, we actually didn't used to have coyotes here, you know, 60 years ago. They kind of moved in to, to kind of fulfill some of that role that, that we had with wolves. Um, but a lot of those major predators were actually able to pick out adult deer, um, sick and injured adult deer. And, and coyotes can occasionally get a, an injured deer or sick adult deer, but mainly they're focusing on those, those, those fawns. And so when we looked at some of the you know, we, we did actually have some collars on deer um, in Massachusetts back in the early 2000s, and we found um, very, very high survival rates on our adults. You know, and most of the, the, most of the mortality factors were either vehicle, vehicle collisions or, um, or hunting related. Um, and so there's really few that, you know, that are taken down by the predators that we have today. And so um, even once you add in vehicle collisions and the predation on fawns and everything, we still have increasing deer numbers in many of these areas um, where we don't have you know enough hunting access to really remove animals from that population um, and so what will happen you know eventually it might take a very long time um, but eventually those deer numbers will get high enough that they start to you know you might have overwinter death because there's you know starvation because there's not enough food um, that's not something we typically see here in Massachusetts. I hope we don't ever get to that point, um, but it is always a possibility in the future. And so we want to make sure that, that and it's not like if, if you have a, di like a, a starvation event that it's going to magically balance the population back down. It just kind of knocks them down a little bit and then they'll be right back up there in a few years. So it's not really a, you know, a natural type of event. Um, and then the other point is, you know, we kind of think of ourselves as, well, you know, we're not, predators, but mountain lions and wolves were. Um, but actually humans were a significant predator of, of deer throughout history. And these, this was something that they were hunted year round. And if you know much about deer, um, they're very easy to, to get close to in the summertime. You know, you could really take a lot of deer um, through hunting during that time of the year, but it's not something that our agency and many states would um, really want to move too far forward because then they still have fawns that are relying on them, at, you know, in the earlier in the summer. So we wait until in the fall after, you know, a, a point in time for fair chase before we have our hunting seasons. Um, but I think this is, a, this is a big point. And, and as I'll show you later, the places where we do have um, enough hunting access, we seem to have pretty good control over um, deer numbers. We don't see them increasing in, in size too much. And so our main goal uh, for our deer management program is to keep deer numbers below a point where they have major impacts to the forest, but also balance all those public desires. And so if we were to throw a number at this to say what density of deer would meet that goal, um, generally keeping deer numbers within the six to 18 deer per square mile range uh, generally meets that goal. And so we know that because there's some literature out there that looked at um, deer numbers and, and at what point do they start to have impacts to the forest. In a typical new, n northeastern um, forest, you tend to see that around 20 deer per square mile, they start to have those impacts where you start to lose, you know, some of your oak and maple saplings and it starts to shift towards some of those less desirable species. Um, and so that's kind of our benchmark. Um, and as you can see, everything west of 495 in general, we're, we're within that range. You know, you're always going to have pockets like we know there's some pockets and down here in zone eight and down here in zone nine where, you know, 
in that local area, the deer numbers are much higher than what we'd like them to be. Um, and even in zone eight, you have areas up on the north here where they're actually lower than we'd like them to be. And so you have a lot of this variability on the landscape. Um, and a lot of that comes down to hunting access, right? So where you have a lot more hunting access, you tend to have a little bit more um, hunting occurring and, and you're taking more deer. Um, but we use these, these larger management zones here, one through, there's actually 15 of them. We broke up four north and south um, to kind of break up the state in a way that's not based on town boundaries per se. It's, it's geologic boundaries because deer don't know whether they're in town X or town Y, they, but they do know whether they crossed a river or not or a major highway, something like that. And so these are big enough that we can, um, that we can get enough data from what we collect biologically on deer to make informed decisions, but not um, so big that it, you know, that it ge over generalizes things at a smaller scale. And then as you can see in our eastern part of the state, you know, we tend to have our issues with, with higher deer numbers so that on average, even in some of our places where we do have, you know, public land to hunt, even there we still seem to have deer numbers a little bit higher than we'd like them to be because there's so much sanctuary around those areas. And so how do we manage deer in Massachusetts? Uh, we manage it the same way that, that pretty much every state um, in the country manages their white tailed deer population through licensed hunters. And so we have a regulated hunting season. Um, the hunters that participate had to have taken a hunter education course um, where they learn the safety um, of using uh, firearms and everything and, and understanding what, what their role is. Uh, we have a youth deer season that takes place on the Saturday, the end of September, beginning of October. It's just a one day season. We kind of were stuck with that because of um, uh, the way the statutes intersected. Um, and then our archery season, we did have a, a new expansion for the first time this year. It started two weeks earlier, so it, it started Oct um, October 1st. Mm -hmm and that runs until November 24th. And so that's for the Eastern zones, the ones that were you know, yellow through, through red in that map. Um, because there's higher deer numbers, we can uh, support an extension in the archery season and hopefully that will help. But the rest of the state doesn't start until October 15th for the archery season. And then we have a two week shotgun season that starts the uh, Monday after Thanksgiving, runs for two weeks. And then after that, we have a primitive firearms season that runs until the end of the year. But during any one of these seasons, if you wanted to use archery methods, you could use archery methods during any time. So it's essentially open in, in Eastern Mass. It's open from October 1st to December 31st if you know, you're using archery methods. Um, so a lot of the towns like you know, in the Eastern Mass that, that have restrictions on firearms and you're only able to use archery methods, um, they are something that can be used during that entire time. And then based on these these management zones, um, we, we manage the deer populations through the female harvest. So you can take males out of the population, but all it takes is one male to, you know, to reproduce with many females. And so taking males out of the population doesn't necessarily manage your population um, that much, but taking a female out of the population um, essentially removes that female and any future offspring that she might have. And so you, know, you are managing that population over time by, by taking females. And so we allocate a certain number of permits to allow hunters to do that. And so in zone two, for instance, um, we're only allocating like 200 antlerless deer permits. So you know, we have thousands of hunters that want them. And so there are only about 10% of the hunters that want to take a doe that put in for a permit can get one. So it's very low odds of getting a permit um, because we, you know, we're trying to get that population closer to where we want it in our goal. We don't give out a lot of, of permits. But and then in our eastern parts, um, like zone nine, everybody that wants a, to, to get an antlers deer permit can get one. In zone 10, you could get multiple. You could get up to over six or seven permits. Um, and it allows you to take more females. Uh, one of the things is every single deer that is, that is taken by a hunter must be reported. It's mandatory reporting. They can take it to a check station. Uh, we have over 80 check stations across the state. Or they can report online with the exception of that first week of the shotgun season, because that's when we have about 40 of our staff throughout the state collecting data from these check stations. So they need to bring their deer um, to one of those check stations so we can get ages and, and um, weights and everything. And as you can see from the harvest, um, it's only gone up since 1966. And this past year was a record year, um, mostly because the conditions were pretty good for, for hunting. And, you know, in years where we have uh, really poor conditions, especially on those openers, like the shotgun opener. Uh, rainy day uh, can really 
dramatically changed the, the total harvest for the entire year just because you know, fewer hunters went out because it was, it was too rainy or the conditions weren't right. So um, things wor worked out really well this past year. Our harvest was high. Um, and another part of that is we were kind of increasing our deer numbers in the west and central part of the state and still trying to drop them in our east. Um, and if you can kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about here with the blue line is our harvest for everything west of I-495. And so historically, we're looking back from 1985 until now. Um, most of those zones, we did have a little increase in our population in the 90s where, you know, it got a little bit too high. We, we gave out more permits to drop those deer numbers and it worked. And we reduced deer numbers and have been kind of stabilizing them over the past 10 or 12 years in most of those zones, trying to keep them, you know, right in that balance. Um, and in some cases, trying to increase them a little bit where they're too low. And then if you look at our zones in the east, the red line here, we went from, you know, 30 years ago, it was people never even saw a deer in, in some of these towns. You know, it was rare to see a deer. And to now, you know, it's very common to see deer and our harvest is, is kind of showing us that throughout these areas. Yes. Is that only hunted deer? This is or deer is that harvest. Or killed by auto also? We do not include automobile okay. kill, yeah. Um, we don't have a good handle on how many deer are killed through automobiles because it depends on reporting. Um, if we rely on police reports, we're probably getting, you know, 1,200 a year. But if we look at, um, like, State Farm Insurance Company, they have the money and the funds to, uh, to hire statisticians to look at this kind of stuff. Um, and their estimates are, are somewhere between seven and 9,000 deer um, collisions per year in Massachusetts, which I'd say is probably pretty reasonable. You know, so in, in, you know, we're taking, you know, in, in combination, we're taking around 13,000 deer a year in the state, and we're probably hitting, you know, at least seven or 8,000 on the roads each year as well. Um, what I would say about the collision data is it's, if you're able to map that across the state, um, which we can't do, but you tend to have more collisions in your eastern part of the state than you do in some of the other parts of this, you know, western and, and central part of the state. I'm sure there's a combination related to, you know, road traffic and, and size of roads and, and all that, but it's probably also related to the deer density as well. Um, like I said, we, during that first week of the shotgun season, this is where we have all our staff out um, collecting biological data. And this is really what drives our decision-making process throughout the state. And so this is a critical time of the year um, where we get kind of a snapshot of what's going on um, throughout the state. So what about suburban areas? This is one of those places where, you know, the, the mindset of, well, you, you took away forest and you added houses, so you should have, you know, made less forest for the deer, which forces them into a smaller amount of area, and they should do poorly. Um, but what actually happens is you cut trees, you created a lot of, of um, fragmented habitat where there's more edge, where there's more sunlight, which makes more plants, um, and then you have houses with landscaping, which is extra food in the winter, um, and deer seem to do really well with that. And so it actually makes... Um, a pretty good setting for deer to, to flourish. Um, and then the other part of it is, in a lot of these places you are getting, um, you know, the other thing is like in Eastern Mass, we used to think there weren't very high numbers of coyotes. And so you, you would have, you know, higher deer survival because of that. But now we actually see some of our highest coyote numbers are in our Eastern um, part of the state. And so um, you still have plenty of coyotes. You still have deer vehicle collisions, but we tend to see deer numbers continuing to, to grow in these towns and same with the issues related to, to that growth. Um, I think the biggest factor in, as you go into these suburban areas is that the, the limitation on access. And so there's a state law that, that basically sets up these um, discharge setbacks. And so within 150 feet of a hard surface paved public highway, um, you cannot discharge a firearm or hunt no matter what. Um, and then around every occupied dwelling, um, you would draw a, a circle around that of 500 feet, and that is a discharge setback around that, that dwelling. And you cannot, um, you cannot hunt or discharge a firearm within the, that setback unless you get permission from the home. Um, so you could do it, um, but it's feasible. You know, when, you, when you're talking about a block of forest surrounded by 20 homes, it's, you know, logistically impossible to get those permissions to be able to hunt a, pro a small property. 
And so you end up having a, a situation, a suburban area, where everything's pretty much um, closed to hunting, so you have a sanctuary for these deer to just continue to grow in numbers. And then in addition to that, you have towns that put in place um, ordinances or bylaws that, you know, we're going to prohibit firearms in the, in the town, or we're going to require written permission to hunt, those types of things. Um, and those are extra barriers on, on top of it. And so if we were to map all the towns in Massachusetts, um, this is a little bit outdated, but it, it gets the picture across. Um, and the type of town bylaws that they have that can restrict hunting access and, and everything, um, you, get, you get a picture here. You know, in, in the eastern part of the state, you have things from no distance of firearms to requiring written permission. And these tend to be the same towns where um, we deal with some of those issues with high deer numbers. And for Sh Sherborne, um, I found the, the bylaw says no person shall fire or discharge any firearms, um, blah, 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 um, on public property or on any private property except with the written consent of the owner or legal occupant thereof. So essentially it's written permission if you want to uh, discharge a firearm. Um, and then when you kind of map what I was talking about, those setbacks around every dwelling, and you get a sense of, all right, so this town has this much land. Um, how much of it is in setback? How much is not in setback? You know, what, what do we have to work with um, for hunting access just based on setbacks alone? And you map that, you start to see, um, you know, obviously around Worc Worcester and Springfield, you have, you know, it's very urban. You would expect that. Um, but then in some of these areas, you tend to see, you know, even though there, um, you know, there's houses, there's lots of houses. There's also a lot of forest and a lot of deer habitat as well. But they're that darker red, which is more of the forest is, is locked up and set back. And so you can see in the town of Sherborne, you're in that 65 to 75% range. Um, and it, when I show this map, it shows me two, two things. Like the places where we have really good control of our deer numbers are the areas in, in this really light color where we have, you know, very few limitations on hunting access. We have really good control over deer numbers through hunting and, and you know, giving out permits. And then the, the darker the red, tend to be those areas of the state where we have limited ability to manage deer numbers um, solely through, through hunting because of this. And if I were to kind of draw a line around the state where we are dealing with our highest deer numbers, um, tend to be these areas where we have very high amount of the forest is locked up in those discharge setbacks. And so to kind of demonstrate this, here's your town. Um, here's a layer of discharge setbacks around all the dwellings. And typically, if, if we're looking at a town and over half the forest is locked up in those discharge setbacks, that tends to be on the realm of you're probably going to be dealing with deer issues in your town. Um, if you look at Sherborne, you're probably over 75% of the forest in the town is, you know, closed to hunting unless you get permission, right? So it's, it's essentially closed to hunting. And even the areas that are outside of those, you know, so yeah, you could legally hunt in here that's outside of discharge setbacks, but now who owns it? And, you know, is it a land trust? Is it closed to hunting? Most of these places in here probably are closed to hunting. Some of it's maybe private land. It could be hunted. Um, and so you start to see here, even though 31% of the forest is not in setback, once you figure out which ones are open and closed to hunting, you end up seeing, you know, you only have 10% of the whole town that you could even hunt in. So how can you really manage um, deer numbers throughout the entire town if you can only manage them on 10% of the entire town, right? So that's kind of the challenge that we deal with. And so for me as a, um, as a biologist with the state, working with towns, there's a lot that once we get down this road, you start to see that a lot of the control um, and ability to manage deer in your town is actually in the hands of the town or the private um, citizens in the town. And so as far as what we can do is we can create the framework to, you know, for the seasons and the permits and everything. Um, but there's a lot of those limitations that are put in place that, you know, are outside of our ability to do. Um, looking at the harvest for, Sh for Sherborne, uh, going back to 2000, you can kind of see, so this harvest would be taking place on areas within the town that are outside of discharge setbacks that would be, you know, potentially open to hunting. And so over time, these are places that would be hunted, right? which is gonna differ from places that might be a large area that's been closed to hunting for, you know, for as long as you can remember. Um, and so what we're seeing with the harvest here is, I'm seeing a pretty stable trend, which can give me some indication that the, the deer in those areas where that are hunted, um, 
potentially could be relatively stable in numbers. Maybe not. You know, there's a lot going on. Um, but what I would imagine is if, you, if you're looking at deer numbers in areas where there is no hunting, um, during this in the same time frame, you'd probably see the numbers, the deer numbers would be increasing during that time. Um, but in the places where there is hunting access, it doesn't appear that way. Um, and when you convert the harvest, you know, so you're taking 72 deer last year. Um, what does that mean? If you want to compare that to kind of other towns and really get an idea of what that means, you have to look at it per square mile, right? So if your town's twice the size of another town, you expect to take more deer because it's bigger. And so this actually equates to about 5.8 deer per square mile of all the forest in the town. But we know that most of that's locked up to, you know, no dis, you know, because of discharge setbacks. So if you look at the land that's outside discharge setbacks, it ends up being about 20 deer per square mile that are removed, right? So I would say that, you know, you're probably pretty high deer numbers if you're able to take that many out of the population and to still have deer. So that, looking at the harvest alone can give me some idea of what's going on in the town um, as far as what your deer numbers are. So are you below 20 deer per square mile? Probably not. Are you above, you know, 30 deer per square mile? Probably. You know, so based on the harvest alone, we can get some idea of what's going on. Um, but I'd like to know a little bit more. And so um, kind of looking at exactly this question. So one of the big questions I get from any town really is, well, tell me how many deer are in my town. And I can't really answer that question. You know, I can't, I, we can come up with, remember back the, the management zones I showed, we can use the data to come up with some large scale um, estimates of, of deer density within those areas, but it's coming from harvest data so it's a density of deer in huntable lands. It's not a density of deer in, in non-huntable lands. And so that number can be much higher. And so if you want to get to that number, um, then you, start, you have to start looking at other ways that can often get um, expensive. So in general, in generally, our estimates on huntable lands are you know, within that 10 to 20 deer per square mile in, in the western and central mass and more like 20 to 50 uh, per square mile in, in our eastern and, um, you know, out to the islands. But we do have some properties that, you know, large public lands within zone 10 or 11 where the deer numbers seem to be right where we want them. But then you go a half a mile down the, down the road and the deer numbers look very high, right? So there's a lot of that, that variability on the landscape. So we could conduct some surveys to estimate deer numbers at a smaller scale. This is kind of what I spent my graduate work on. Um, there's ways to do it, but they're time intensive. They can be expensive, and when you come up with a number, you might come up with an estimate of, well, we got um, an estimate of 30 deer per square mile with a confidence interval of five to 60 deer per square mile. You know, <laughs> so what does that really tell you? <laughs> you know, I could tell you have at least that many deer, right? So it's not as informative as I think people want. Um, there are ways to kind of make it a little bit more tighter of a confidence interval with more surveys and more time, but you're talking about more time and a limited, you know, where it's just hard to, to devote that much time um, to some of these areas. So an easier way is, you know, just instead of asking how many deer do we have, say, I don't know what the number of deer are in our town, but is it, is it too many? You know, are we concerned that there's too many deer? And are we seeing impacts to the forest and the habitat because of it? And if so, then it's probably above what our agency would like to see. Right, so you don't necessarily need to know that there are 42 deer per square mile in your town, um, but you can you know, have a good understanding that it's whatever it is, it's probably higher than what you would like to see. Um, and so we can kind of look at that with looking at forest impact surveys. It's a lot quicker and um, cheaper to do those types of surveys. You can spend a day in, the, in, the, in a town going through some of the forest and getting a sense of what it looks like. And so we were able to do that in, in some of your town in the past, um, and a lot of the other towns around there. Um, and this kind of gives you some idea of what we were seeing. It looks like we surveyed most of this section here. We didn't do much over here. Um, but the, the, the greener the color, the less impact we saw, the darker the orange and into the, you know, you don't have any reds in, in this shot, but um, the darker the color, the, the more impact we saw. And so we're getting these, these estimate or these values based on um, looking at, you know, typical um, forest saplings that would be growing in a forest. And we know that, you know, you could walk into a forest and you would see browsing on 
on red maple or sugar maple or, or white oak, that doesn't tell me much. That tells me that there are deer there, right? But if I'm seeing that they're browsing on things that they typically don't browse on, um, now you're getting into some of the you know, moderately preferred things like um, black cherry. It might be something that you, I would imagine you would see deer browsing that here. Um, but if you go into some of our areas in central Massachusetts where the deer numbers are you know, a little bit more balanced with the habitat, you would rarely see them browsing on that because there's better foods to eat. And so you start to look at some of these, these um, tree species. You can look at herbaceous plants. You can look at shrubs. And you get a sense of things that you just don't typically see them browsing on um, when their deer numbers are where they should be. And if you're seeing them browse on those things, we call them indicator species or indicator plants. That gives us some sense of how high they are. And then when you start looking at some of those plants, like um, American beech is like an even further step. We typically don't see deer browsing on American beech. If we do see that, it gives us a little bit higher of a, of a level of impact um, because they are, there's fewer things available, so they have to go to those different um, things. And then, you know, all the way up to white pine. White pine is kind of a desperation food. They sh really shouldn't be eating that. Um, if you're seeing them browse that, that's uh, pretty bad, you know. And, um, you know, as I was driving in, I was kind of looking at some of the impacts around houses. It gives me a sense of what's going on in the town um, over and above what, you know, some of these surveys. But, you know, I definitely saw some of the arborvitaes around people's houses were for browse, pretty clear browse line in that. Um, it is something that deer will eat in the winter. Um, you know, you would even see a little bit of browsing on that where we have low deer numbers. But, um, you know, a complete browse line does give me some indication that the deer numbers here you know, a little bit on the high side. And then um, one of the other things I saw was some of the rhododendrons were browsed yeah. pretty heavily. Yeah. And if you know anything about rhododendrons and, and uh, mountain laurel, they actually have um, some toxic properties in them that are toxic to deer. And so when we tend to see deer eating those types of things, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that they can handle with a little bit of um, browsing on that. But if they ate a, a whole bunch of it, they could actually, you know, build up toxins in their body and, and die from it. So it's not something you would typically see them browsing on unless they're desperate. And so looking at all these things together gives me a sense of, you know, where we are with, you know, deer levels in the town. Um, so I can't exactly give you a number, but even if I did, it would probably be a different number here than it would be here, right? So you're going to have throughout the, the town different levels of, of deer. Um, so that's, you know, in addition to the harvest data, now we can look at some of the impacts to the forest. Um, this is a picture that one of our technicians took of um, within Broadmoor. And, you know, what we tend to see is this, you know, your large white pines and hemlocks and then a sea of huckleberry. And all those things are things deer don't eat. And so if you're looking at high deer numbers over the past 20 years, you have a forest that may have been more diverse. Um, slowly shift as deer numbers increase um, to them browsing some of the more preferred species to, you know, this is what you could have you know, in 20 years in the entire town if, you know, high deer numbers continue because they're going to browse everything that, you know, a little, a little maple shoot tries to make it up. You know, if, if it's browsed heavily within the, you know, a few years, um, it's never going to survive, right? So, and we tend to see that when we walk through a forest like this, you'll see a little oak sapling kind of hidden in the huckleberry that hasn't been found yet, but as soon as it pokes through, it gets browsed. And you tend to see a lot of dead stems of stuff that, that they ate. Um, so anyways, that's kind of what, what it can be. And, and this is not a, a healthy forest from our standpoint. It's not able to, um, it's not diverse. It's not able to, to sustain the different, you know, threats that a forest deals with throughout time. Um, so it's, this is something we'd be concerned about. All right, all right so back to a town. So what, what can a town do, right? So our agency can, you know, provide permits. We can provide you know, a season length, that type of thing. But what can the town do? Um, I kind of went through some of the issues. But I'd say the biggest one is, at a minimum, see what land the town owns and operates and manages and look if, if any of those properties are feasible to allow hunting. You know, certainly some might be very heavily used by the public. It's not something you think would be, you know, a place where you'd like to have it. But if it's a place where you're having really, really high deer um, issues, then maybe it's you know, something you should consider. And so I'd, I'd say that at a minimum looking at where you have lands and, and considering whether to allow access onto that. Um, be proactive. So a lot of towns, you know, if, if I were to go to some of these towns before they get to a level where their deer numbers are really high, 
and say, I think you should do something. We're starting to see impacts to the forest. You know, what the typical response is, well, we're not really hearing it from the public. They don't seem to want us to do anything, so we're not going to do anything. You know, but then fast forward 10 years, now everybody wants you to do something. And your deer numbers, instead of us dealing with the problem when you were at 20 to 30 deer per square mile, now we're trying to come in and deal with it when you're at 50, you know, 60 deer per square mile. And it's a lot harder to knock them down um, if, if you're starting at a much higher level, especially if you're dealing with restrictions already, like if you don't allow firearms and you're archery only, you have a lot better chance to reduce them if you are starting from 20 to 30 deer per square mile through archery than if you're trying to reduce them at a very high level. And so proactive is key. You know, I wouldn't wait too long to, to start the process. Establish some goals. So, you know, we're, we're going to be trying to look at forest health throughout this time. You know, I'd like to get back to some of these sites every five years or so. Um, we can do as much as we can, but the town can help as well. And, you know, I've been working with some of the towns to see if they can collect some of the data that we use. Um, but keeping records as a town, you know, one of the biggest things I would say is ask your police station to do their best to record all the collisions that they, they see and, um, and look at that over time. You know, see if, if you're seeing anything, if, you know, if you're really opening up hunting access throughout the town um, and you feel like you are making an impact on the deer population, you would think that your deer collisions would tell you the same story, right? So you would assume that um, if you're seeing the, the, the collisions go up by 20% every year and all of a sudden, you know, you've done something as a town and you want to, you know, you would expect that it's either going to go to 10% or, or maybe if you're lucky, no increase or maybe decrease. You know, it all depends on how much of an impact you made on that population. And then education and communication, trying to get everybody on board. Um, one of the biggest things is you're not alone in it. As, as the town of Sherborne, you're not alone in this. You have neighbors that have already gone through this process. Some have already opened their you know, lands to hunting. They've already established these types of controlled hunts. So you're not starting from scratch. You can learn by some of the other towns what they've done, um, some of the things they wish they would have done better, you know, those types of things to help you get the ball rolling and get up to speed. Um, so yeah, working at a regional scale. And also the deer that are in your town are also you know, if it's on the edge of your town, they're probably in the other town too. And so there's deer moving back and forth. And so working at a regional level is, is really important. Um, as far as hunting access, so whether you're a private citizen or you're a town, um, there's a very strong liability law in Massachusetts. It's one of the st strongest in the country for um, landowner liability. So if you do not charge a fee for someone to, to use your property rec to recreate, so we're not just talking about hunting, we're talking about if you let people on your property to, to hike or, or you know, um, ski or snowshoe, that type of thing, um, and you don't charge them a fee, if they get injured on your property, it, you will not be liable for that injury unless you did something you know, on purpose to hurt them. And uh, so this would apply to hunting as well. Um, encourage homeowners to allow hunting within 500 feet of their home. So you might have a block of forest that you know there's a lot of deer in there, but um, Maybe you could get all 20 homes around it to, instead of, you know, a blanket permission of 500 feet, maybe they're willing to do 200 feet. Um, and so that opens up a little bit more space that you could get a few hunters in and, and start to remove deer. Um, and then restrictive bylaws. I would say, you know, you do have a bylaw in town that, that limits um, firearm use with written permission. It's not the most prohibitive, you know, so there's other towns that are much worse. So I would say you're not in that bad a shape with with how restrictive it is on hunting. Um, so it's probably fine. All right, so this is the stuff that I get excited about. I don't know if you get excited about maps, but I do. Um, so here's a map of the, of the town, and all the green is forested land, all the, the gray is non-forested land, so around houses and everything. Um, and then there's a, a gray discharge setback layer kind of overlaid over that. So you know, this is forest that's outside ch uh, discharge setbacks. This is all the forest that's in discharge setbacks. And so, you know, a, a square mile deer home range, you know, you're looking at something like this. So these deer would be using this entire block of forest all around here, you know, and they could be spending all their time right in here within these, you know, behind these houses. Um, and so if this were private land and it's open to hunting right now, if that deer happened to come into that land during the hunting season and be taken by a hunter, then that's helping reduce the deer numbers in this, in this larger area. Um, and you can start to see what you're working with in the town. Um, this is the 
open space layer. So this tells you who owns the properties that are open space. So the, the light pink are ones that are owned by the town. The darker pink are ones that are owned by um, land trusts. The yellow are, are private, but typically have some sort of conservation restriction on them. Um, the green is, is, the dark green here is DCR, and this blue is federal, so this would be Charles River. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is I just heard from trustees of reservations that they have just recently opened um, their properties here to hunting. And so because the town owns this little block here, this would be like an, you know, a low-hanging fruit, I would say, for properties to consider. Um, first, because it would already be probably easy for them to incorporate in their managed hunt, you know, just to simply add this land to their, you know, it would be very little on your end to try to manage anything, um, just to see how things get going. Um, but the next step is looking at the town land, so this pink, and how much of that town line is, is outside of discharge setbacks. And so you can kind of see, you know, there's a lot of it's locked up in these discharge setbacks, but you do have some outside. And if you were to map that, um, and sum it all up, you have over 600 acres of town land that is outside of discharge setbacks that if you were to allow hunting right now, you would have, you, know, you wouldn't have to worry about discharge setbacks or anything on these properties. Um, and that would be a, you know, what you could work with essentially. And then to kind of visualize this, so keeping in mind the home ranges of deer and, and how far they would roam, you know, if you're going to have hunting on say this property alone, is it going to have any impact on what you're dealing with deer numbers up here? Probably not. Will it help with deer numbers in this area? Probably. And so to kind of show that this is the same map, but putting an overlay of about a quarter of a mile, because that's, you know, what I would expect for the deer that are coming into this property would at some point venture into anywhere in the yellow, maybe even further, but, you know, likely somewhere in here. And the point I want to make here is, Working with what you have, it does give you a pretty good um, spread across the town. It's not like it's you know one or two properties and, and you don't have much of a ability to do do anything. You you could actually have a much better control of your deer numbers throughout the town, and then especially when you add in you know if there are other private properties in here, um, and then trustees uh, reservations land here. You know this is going to further expand that. And the other point I want to make is a lot of times when we look at these properties. You know, you see a property that's two acres, and you're like, that's a waste of time. Why would we open that? That's, you know, that's not going to help us. But some of these small properties are the only thing. So these three small properties, you could have a, an archery hunter here, an archery hunter, an archery hunter here. Um, or what I would recommend is instead of having three people, you let up to 20 people, and they have a sign out so that you're always having somebody coming in. And then that also allows, if each, each one of those people have five antlers deer permits, you can take a lot more deer out of that property by doing something like that. But without these small properties, you wouldn't really be able to do anything to control deer in the central part of this town. Um, so these small properties, I think, are important to include um, in part of your management program. So um, this is kind of the, the summary of the town, the lands you have, and I would say your next steps should, would be, what I would recommend is to start looking at these properties, see what you think is feasible, um, and you know, start working from there. And I can happy to help throughout that process and certainly some of these you're going to find out that you know we, we definitely don't want to allow hunting there it's you know extremely busy or it's just not the right um, setting for it and that's fine you know it's just a matter of working with what you have and and hopefully being able to remove additional deer will be enough to start you know getting your deer numbers down or even just preventing the growth that you're seeing now you know so i think that's it for this part um and uh, it, you can ask questions from what I covered, or if there's something I didn't cover, you can ask a question. I can kind of get to it. So, Thank you. in the back. How many people were killed by deer? Um, that would be something that our agency doesn't record, but I'm sure you could probably get that from the state police. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how many so his question was, how many humans are killed by deer every year? And he's looking at from deer vehicle collisions primarily. Um, I know that there was one in Weston last year. And I feel like when I read the, the news article, they said it was like the second or third known. I want to say, does that seem right? 
So it doesn't seem like a very high number of humans that are killed by deer collisions each year, but um, it's always a risk, yeah. So the trustees of reservations over the past 10 years have been continuing to, to open their lands to hunting. A lot of their lands that they've had in the western, western and central part of the state have always been open to hunting. Um, and a lot of the ones that they've had in the eastern part were, you know, closed to hunting when they, when they acquired it. And they looked through the deeds to make sure there was no restrictions. And if not, then they would, they've been working to, to open those lands. And so um, the trustees of reservations has definitely, I guess they go by the trustees now has definitely been continuing to, to increase access. Um, and, and a lot of times they're one of the, you know, in a town that, that has no hunting access or very little, you know, they're one of the first properties in the town. Um, and one of the things that I would say with them is they've done a good job of not overly complicating it as well. And so the, they'll take a property and just open it to hunting, for instance, to anybody. Um, or they, you know, if they feel like they need to, they'll they'll cap the number at, you know, 50 hunters that they're going to let in and they just, you know, they don't overdo it where they don't assign them, you know, an individual tree and say, you have to hunt there, you know, that kind of thing. It, you know, the more you complicate it, the less your ability is to actually take deer um, to some point. There's always a trade-off. Um, let's take back here. Yeah. In the area where you only have a very small Yeah, exactly. That's that's a tough one because it's not that easy to um, you know take out a map and figure it out. But I would say that most of our hunters have smartphones, and what they can do is look on Google Maps where their location is, put it on aerial photo layer, and you can click a little button that allows you to measure a measure tool. And then you say, all right, I am here, and I'm going to measure to this house, and it's 600 feet, so I am good right here. And so most of them use that, that ability, I would say. Um, we don't really have that many issues that I know of with hunters accidentally hunting within the discharge setbacks. Um, every year we do have people that intentionally try to hunt too close to houses without permission. Um, so it, it is on the hunter, though, to, to do that. They need to know... And if, so I would say if any of you ever come across a hunter that is closer than 500 feet of your house and you didn't give them permission, then absolutely call the environmental police and uh, report that because that is an illegal activity. And, and what those types of illegal activities um, tend to kind of leave a, a sour taste in people's mouth about hunters in general. And um, I guess what I can say is some of the towns that have moved to these types of programs, like Weston, for instance, um, it was pretty common to have some hunting violations in the past on their properties that were close to hunting. And they would always find tree stands in there. They'd always hear stories of, you know, people sneaking in there. Um, but once they, they regulated the hunting and they allowed hunters that they, you know, vetted or whatnot on that property, it kind of, they self-policed the property and kept some of that um, illegal activity out of there. And, and some of the, you know, the, the bad eggs, as we will, um, out of the property and, and got the more responsible hunters in there. So, you know, that is something that we have seen in a lot of these towns. It's actually helped improve some of the illegal activity. Can you repeat the questions because we can't hear? Okay, sorry. So her question was, um, how does a hunter know that they're actually outside of a discharge setback or not? So the 500 feet. Um, go ahead. <coughs> is there any way of knowing how many private people allow hunting on their land? If I, I wish I would know that. I mean, that is, if I could have any piece of data across the state, that would be a, a gold mine for me. Um, to have some idea of, of, you know, basically when I'm looking at the harvest, and if I could take harvest in a town, you know, the total deer that are killed in a town through hunting, and I could divide it by the huntable area, that would give me you know, a really good ratio, um, but that's a really hard number to come by. You would actually have to go to every property, see if there's posted signs or not. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with, but most of the state, um, if it doesn't have a town bylaw that requires written permission, um, as long as you don't see posted signs around a property and it's privately owned, you can access that property, you know, for recreation or hunting or whatnot. Um, so you don't need to get permission to hunt on, on 
most of the properties in the state. Now, if it's a town land, and it does, you know, it falls under a different jurisdiction. So you need to then check with the town to see if it's open or not. Um, but for private land, it's it needs to be conspicuously posted with a posted sign that has your name and address and, and information on it um, for it to hold up in court as for trespass. So that's I think it's an important point. Yes. I have a tick question can, and it relates to, I know that deer aren't carriers in general of tick-borne diseases, uh, but they do increase the population. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there's any known correlation between deer population and the per capita of people being infected with with tick-borne diseases. Yeah, and so I think there are a lot of research studies out there, and I think the what people originally thought it was is probably something linear, like if you had you know, 10 deer per square mile, you'd have this rate, and if you had 20, you'd have this rate, and if you had 40, you'd have double that rate, and it'd be some linear relationship. Um, but what I think we're actually finding out is that it's this some sort of threshold where um, if you keep deer numbers below you know, 12 deer per square mile, you tend to have, you're starting to limit tick abundance because they're not able, you have adult females that are looking for a blood meal, primarily something at this high, which is typically a deer, um, and if they get that blood meal, then they'll successfully have eggs. They'll drop off and have eggs on the landscape. Um, so if they cannot find a blood meal because there's not enough deer in the landscape that they come in contact with one, then they will not make those eggs, and you get to the point where you're starting to limit the tick numbers. But if you're anywhere above that, whether you're at um, 20 deer per square mile or 40 deer per square mile, you're not, you're now, there's enough deer in the landscape that ticks are able to find their blood meal. Um, I'm sure there's some sort of relationship, like if you looked at um, tick abundance and, and cases of, of tick-borne illness in a population and you knew that the deer numbers in this pop, this part of the town was, you know, around 30 deer per square mile and this other area in a town nearby was 100 deer per square mile. I would imagine you'd probably have higher incidence in the area with higher deer numbers, but it's it's not linear by any means. Is what I think what we're finding out. So in the western part of the state, maybe they have 18 deer per square mile. It yeah. may not be very different. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's patchy too, and so just like you can walk in a in one property and, and, and there's very low deer numbers and the impact's very low, and you can go a mile down the street and it's completely opposite because these deer are so, like they establish a home range and they don't go, it's not like they know that, boy, if I walk four miles that way, there's a whole bunch of food. Like they kind of just stay there. And so um, the same thing with ticks, right? So if you have a really high local deer population, there's not, there's, you're doing nothing to control ticks. Um, but then if you're down the street and you're able to reduce deer numbers, and maybe you're dealing with ticks there. And so we kind of see that um, if I think if you went to the CDC website and looked at Lyme disease cases, you actually do have a little um, patches in, in western Massachusetts in the Berkshires where you do have high incidence rates. Um, and some of that might be, you know, some of, those, some of those towns do have some restrictions. And, you, you know, we can go out to some of these properties in western Massachusetts and I can see places where there's really high deer numbers. Um, typically those places are ones where it's, you know, there's no deer hunting signs all around and you see browse lines everywhere and... No, but um, yeah, I mean, it's patchy and it's, it's tough to record that too. You know, that when they're recording that you went to the hospital and you're treated with Lyme, you know, are they recording where you think you picked up that tick or do they record where you live? You know, that kind of stuff and how it's all reported. So it's, it's not like it's the easiest thing to, to analyze for sure. Did you, do you need me to repeat that? So he asked about, he asked about um, basically the, the ticks and is there a correlation with deer numbers with tick numbers? How can I get a browse list of what they prefer, what they don't quite prefer, and all yeah, the stuff um, at the back end? I can, I can email um, some, Jean, some of the documents that are out there, and she can put it on the town website that you can look at. Um, there's a couple things I could send out. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, just a couple of comments. Russell's uh, garden in uh, Wayland actually has a browse list if you're interested. Um, they, they sell them. And secondly, I'm from Dover and we've had, as you know, a tick management program for, what, seven years now. So we have pretty good data on all this. So I assume you guys know that 
our Board of Health has a lot of statistics. There's about a 50-50 ratio of deer killed by collision vehicles uh, versus the bow hunters. We only allow the bow hunters. And we have a combination of private landowners, town land, the trustees, the Dover Lane Conservation Trust, and uh, we also have an agent that qualifies all the bow hunters. And at least in our town, uh, they've decided to give the bow hunters their own tree stand. So they take very good care of the wow. area uh, around which um, they use their bows. And we've elected not to do the shooting. So there is data from the Dover Board of Health if you want to. Yeah, and I would say is, is a town just starting this, definitely lean on some of these towns that have already gone through it. Like I, I can answer a lot of questions, but if it's what are some of the hurdles that you dealt with as you went through this, another town is certainly going to be a better um, resource for that. And th I, I believe from talking with others in Dover, you did see kind of a, a decrease in the number of deer vehicle collisions over that time frame yeah, after the hunt. Um, it's sort of more or less the same. The same. Honest with you, but okay. we've been increasing incrementally. When you first started, People are horrified, and they're afraid <laughs> they're going to be shot, you know, <laughs> traipsing in the woods and all that. So a lot of it was uh, education, and it starts out small, and uh, gradually more and more private landowners yeah. have been uh, joining. Okay, and that it, and it's and it's it is much for the ticks as it is uh, because yeah. they're uh, annoyed that all their shrubs are being eaten. God damn it! <laughs> so I think you you play to both of those. Um, Right. Yeah. That's why I yeah. 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 Yes. Is contraception ever used to control? That's a good question. So her question was, is contraception ever used to control deer populations? And there are a few studies throughout the country that um, are using either contraceptives um, or sterilization or ones where they're doing a combination of things like um, sterilization and, and sharpshooting or sterilization and hunting and kind of those things. Um, to kind of put it in a nutshell, for the feasibility of using those techniques, I think that they're in certain situations where you have more of a generally closed population, meaning like you don't have deer that can kind of go in and out and come in from other towns um, and it's a small setting. I think that there's some promise shown in those, those settings. Um, but one of the biggest challenges they run into is if you're starting with a high deer population, um, even if you can prevent any new reproduction, you still have, you know, a high deer population and all those mouths to feed. Um, and then you really have to play the waiting game as far as, you know, when are these deer going to die either of natural death or be hit by cars or some other way before you actually start to see a decrease in the population. And if, you, if you're starting out with, you know, a lot of these studies that are looking at that are, you know, unfortunately they're starting at a population that's, over 100 deer per square mile, so they have a long way to go, you know, to get down there. Um, but it, I think it comes down to the, the setting as to whether it's um, would actually get you to what you want for a deer population. Um, and I think it's it's a there's a lot of challenges, just like with their with using hunting as a as a tool. Um, when you get into a landscape where there's you know a lot of habitat for these deer to get to. Um, you know, and come in and out of a town and, and move around, I think it's, it's increasingly challenging as well. Does that answer that? Oh, okay, you're welcome. Yes? Assuming a deer gets past the first year, about how old is the deer when it dies, naturally? Okay, so if you were to look at the age of deer, um, in, in places where we know there's really no hunting going on, or if you have a, a setting where it's, you know, a you're looking at deer that are dying natural deaths in a, in a population um, with, with no hunting um, or not looking at just vehicle collisions. You could have does that are, fe so females that have, have lived over upwards of 20 years in the wild. Um, the bucks tend to have a little bit higher of a, of a mortality rate just because the nature of, um, you know, their, the rutting behavior, the sparring, um, <laughs> getting antlers every year. Uh, every time they get those antlers and the velvet, there's, there's blood available for bacteria and so all their behavior basically puts them at a higher risk so you know it's it's probably rare to see a buck that survives over 10 years um, so they're probably a little bit lower on the lifespan um, 
but in a hunted population, it really depends on your harvest rate, you know, as to the average age. But I would say most of the bucks that we take in the, in the state, um, you know, are, like in a population, if you just took a cross section of it, you're going to have more young because they're, they haven't died yet, right? So every year there's fewer and fewer. Um, but our age structure is kind of half of the harvest is, is um, if, you're, if you're looking at just adult males, about half the harvest is going to be year and a half olds, and the other half is going to be two and a half and older. So that gives you some idea of that. Uh, yes? What does some place like Broadmoor do where there isn't any hunting? And a place like Broadmoor, the, yeah. the sanctuary. Um, so that, I believe, is owned by Mass Audubon. Um, they are definitely seeing the impacts of deer, but it's, it's a challenge for an organization like that um, to deal with starting this. But they have started to open a couple of their properties um, to, limited, to limited hunting. So they are starting to kind of see the rule for this, um, but I don't know as to their future or this specific property. For, so her question was for what is um, the plan for Broadmoor Wildlife Sanctuary? Yes. Um, I have a comment and a question um, on tick populations and Lyme disease prevalence. They have also been, there are a lot of different factors besides deer. Um, Absolutely. Study yeah. Mouse populations mm -hmm. and related to that, fox and coyote populations yeah. as primary predators. So it, it, it's a complicated relationship. Yeah, it's like looking at this big food web and saying that it's. Yeah, it, it, you push this button and everything's gonna yeah, fall so down. I mean, it's it's a complicated thing, but the um, so yeah, there's some research that looks at when you have high acorn abundance, you have a increase in in rodent population. So we have a high number of squirrels this year. Does that mean we're gonna have more ticks surviving? But the the big factor I think is um, so you have the different life stages of a tick. So you have the um, the larval, the nymph, and then the adult. And when they're a larval or nymph, they can really get on anything. You know, they're typically seeking low. Um, they're getting on, on rodents, even birds. Um, they're finding their blood meal pretty much anywhere. But then once they get to that adult size, um, you know, if, if they do get on a mouse or, or something like that, it's pretty easy for those animals to, to groom them off. So a lot of those are, you know, if, if they happen to go on, a, on the wrong host, um, but but gen generally, when they're seeking, so they're going to get up on vegetation and kind of seek in this range. And so what they do is they get up on that, you know, little twig and they put their evil little claws out <laughs> and they, you know, reach for anything that's at that range. And so, yeah, it could end up on something besides a deer. Um, if it ends up on a dog, typically it ends up back in your house. Your dog's treated. You know, that female isn't going to get her blood meal and drop off in three days in the forest if it ends up on your dog, it's unlikely, right? So it, we call that a dead-end host. Same with the human. But the um, mice are the but, original factor for Lyme Correct. Disease. So it's when you're looking at right. when you're looking at Lyme disease, yeah, if you took in chipmunks as well. So if you took out <coughs> white-footed mouse and chipmunks out of the entire population, <coughs> which you can't do, but if you could, then you would probably have a make a dent in the tick-borne in us, right? Right. But yeah, it's it's a complicated web. But um, as far as like, can you control the, all the little things that the, the ticks are getting on? Probably not. Um, but if you're able to do something to drop deer numbers to a low enough level, um, then there is some promise. But it's, it's a tough road to get down to actually get deer numbers down to that low of a level with all those challenges. So I also had a question. As um, a practical matter, how does a town like Dover, an organization like the trustees, or anyone like that who wants to open land hunting, how do they balance that with other uses of the land for you know, walkers and, yeah. and so forth? Yeah, so um, a lot of these towns, hunting culture hasn't really been established here, so it's kind of new. Um, but for most of the state, you know, western, where we actually have much higher um, hunter numbers, but we also have recreation, a lot of those properties, whether it's a DCR property or one of uh, wildlife management areas or town lands in a lot of these towns, um, they don't restrict like activities per se. Like they don't close down um, the whole property during the hunting season, for instance. They allow all that recreation to happen, um, and, and a lot of that is just based on um, you know the hunter behavior relative to other recreation. So, um, as an example, if you have a rail trail that's being used by 
um, hikers and mountain bikers that runs through a property that's hunted. Um, could you say no hunting within 150 feet of that trail? You could, but you probably don't need to because no hunter that actually wants to get a deer is going to be near that trail because there's not going to be deer near that trail during the daylight hours, right? So you're going to have, um, you know, deer that might be using that in after dark, um, but for the most part, the hunters know where to go and they're going to try to get as far away from people as possible. But some of the towns have put in some restrictions to balance that. And so, like, if you feel like that is an issue for your town, you can certainly put in a, you know, no hunting within 100 feet of any of our established trails. And then you make a map and then you can put that on the website. Um, you can even, you have a way to, um, so I've done this with some of the other um, DCR properties where you take a map like this with the discharge setbacks and, and you have properties that are open to hunting and then you put a, you know, a, a setback around trails and you make a map and you put it on um, either Google Earth or you put it in Google Maps and every hunter can download it and they can put it right on their phone and they can be in the woods and they can be like, I'm in, I'm out, <laughs> you know, I can hunt here. And, and that's a huge resource and I think that that's something that is not that hard to do and it, and it should help limit some of those issues. In the western part of the state, the properties are bigger, so it's easier to spread people out. Yeah. As a practical matter, trying to figure out zone within a hundred feet or yards of trails on town land, you would eliminate most of the town land because they're most yeah. With so it, so that's something that you might want to think about for whether to include a property or not. Um, Can I just say, sure. so at least in our town, you know, the hunters aren't going around walking they're in tree stands so it depends where you put the tree stand and they're also bow and arrow going downwards so that has never been a problem no no it, it depends on where you put the tree stands and you put them away from the trails frankly where people are mm -hmm. and that's where your tree eggs to the uh, guy that we have who works part-time and again it's three months of the year basically hunting anyway, it's not the whole time. Um, you know, but it's it's a stationary place. Mm -hmm. it? so. Yeah, so there's certainly ways that towns have dealt with that and each town is different. You know, you can go over, you know, over the top and, and overly restricted or you can just kind of, but one of the things is when you look at some of these properties and you, and you say, okay, feasibly this property, we don't want more than one archery hunter in there, right? You don't want to, like, so you might decide that you don't want to just allow hunters to go anywhere they want in the town. You might want to kind of give them some idea of, you know, a sign-up sheet. Like there's this spot, this property can, can accommodate one hunter or two hunters. You know, you don't want six in there because that might be a problem. So there's, there's definitely ways to do it. I think I'm used to, um, we spent a lot of them in Rhode Island actually. A lot of the towns have big hunting areas. You have to wear blades during hunting season. I mean, that just seems really straightforward. It's a pretty uncautious hunter is not going to notice someone wearing a blade. Yeah, but I would say for, if you've ever, I don't know if many have been up in a tree stand 20 feet above the, the ground, it is amazing how far you can see yeah, and how well yeah. you can see. Like, you can see a person walking a dog from 200 yards away before they even know you're there and you know exactly what they are. Like you're, it would be hard for me to believe that someone would mistake, even if you were wearing all brown, that they would mistake a human for a, for a deer. I mean, especially with archery because you have to keep in mind that you're not even going to take a shot unless a deer gets within about 20 yards, maybe 30 if you're comfortable. Um, I mean, you're not going to make a mistake like that at that close of a range. So we've never had a, a, an incident involving a, an archery hunter and a, a non-hunter ever in Massachusetts. So um, it's never been a, an issue. Yes? On fenced private property, are chickens useful in reducing the tick population? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a, a significant impact. Oh, really? Um, I've heard that guinea fowl are, are a little bit more uh, but worthwhile, that's, but... Uh, that's even been studied in... Uh, <laughs> Is that didn't even seem to do it, yeah. I, I, think you're, I think you'd be better off keeping your grass cut low, keeping a lot of sunlight in your yard, doing the type of things, you know, like tick numbers, I think the most impactful thing on tick numbers is probably weather, right? So if you have dry, hot summer or cold, dry winter um, with no snow cover, those are the type of events that can actually 
you know, drastically change a, a tick population. But because ticks have a two-year life cycle, you'd have to have that occur in two years in a row, right? So you could have something that kills all the, the living ticks, but all their eggs are still there. So you could kill everything, but then the eggs are going to hatch the next spring. So it's, there's a reason why they have a two-year life cycle, because they evolved to be able to withstand stuff like that. But yeah, so it's, it's very challenging to, to control tick numbers. Um, but that's certainly something everyone's interested in. Try. Yeah. <laughs> Chicken yes. Fun. Sorry. Two questions about um, the hunting side. Are there enough archery hunters to serve a town like ours and all yes. the other towns who don't want to have, because of the limited areas, mm -hmm. no, that's, that's a, um, firearms? And then okay. if, if some homeowner let a hunter use their property and either asked for or the hunter gave them some as a result, would that negate the liability clause? Those are two, two great questions. Um, yes, so the first question, see, I already forgot the first question. Are enough archery hunters? Okay, so the first question is, are there enough archery hunters to even like serve this town if they were to open up a hunt? Um, so we have about 35,000 archery hunters in the state. Um, I would say that our highest, our highest number of archery hunters are actually in eastern Massachusetts. And so if you were to kind of map where they live, you would actually see there's a bunch right outside of Boston. So um, I would say there is no, there should be no issues of, if you advertise that you have land that's going to be open to hunting, you will get a lot of people that are interested. You can be as you know, restrictive as you want and you'll still get a lot of people coming that are interested. Um, but for the programs that seem to be the most effective over time have um, worked with the group of hunters that they've allowed in and they've put in some place something to make sure that um, this isn't just a, a special hunt for those people, but rather you actually want them to accomplish a goal for you and take a lot of deer. And if they don't do that, they're not going to be invited back. And so you kind of set up things like we expect that you're going to put in this much time or that you're going to take, you know, a, an antlerless deer. You're not in here just to, to buck hunt. We want you to take females. And if you don't take a female, um, you're going to be off the list and, and you can apply just like everybody else. And what ends up happening is over time you get this, you know, whittles down your, your hunters that are in the program that become, you know, you can take more deer with fewer hunters because they're putting in the time and effort. Mm -hmm. And the towns that are really able to make this work have done that and found ways to really get a group of hunters that are going to put in the time and effort to take a lot of deer for them. So um, yes, that answered the first question. The second question was, is it wrong or does it negate the, the liability law if you ask a hunter to give you meat? Um, I would say if, if you say, I will give you permission to hunt on my property if you give me your meat, then that probably would. Um, but I'm sure you can probably, so any hunter that takes a deer can donate it to anybody. Um, and so a lot, that's a pretty common thing that hunters do is, is they say, you know, um, I'm looking to hunt in here. If I get a deer, you know, I'm happy to share some of the deer meat with you and donate the deer. But you, there can't be any kind of um, reciprocal expect, you know, expectation that, you know, if you don't give me deer meat, you're not allowed back kind of thing. That's, I think that's bordering, um, you're, you're charging a fee for the service, right, for that liability. Um, but it's pretty common that, especially what you have hunters that are getting, you know, four deer a year, they're, and they only need two for their family. They're going to be donating a lot of that meat. And, and um, you know, another thing is um, we have been working with uh, Martha's Vineyard, our very first um, donation program for deer. It's always been a huge challenge. I wish that we could have a, a better donation program. Um, but the... the um, Board of Health, or there's this food law that that deer meat is basically treated like um, like beef in the eyes of, of the USDA in the in the town in the state of Massachusetts. So they're using like the USDA rules for the, rules for their food code. And so if you want to donate a deer um, to say a food bank, a third party, um, so you can donate to anybody. 
individually. And in our environmental and police, if they pick up a deer that's hit on the road, they can donate it to like a civic organization, that kind of thing. Um, but if you want to donate it to like a, a food bank, um, it needs to be inspected by the uh, USDA inspector throughout the whole process. And so essentially that like they would have to be there when it's shot and they'd have to be there while it's butchered and they'd have to, you know, seal it and everything. It becomes so burdensome that it's just not a, it's not feasible. Um, but on the vineyard, we were able to get um, permission from the USDA and the, the state of Massachusetts to um, have a USDA inspector as part of the butchering process. And they were okay with that. And so for the first time ever, they were able to basically say to hunters that were out on, those, on the lands in, in the vineyard, um, if you had extra deer that you weren't going to use, you could donate it and it would be free and you would put the deer here. And they had money through donations that they used to process it and the processor was doing it at a discount. Um, and they were able to, to provide some of the venison. Um, another thing they did was they, they said that if you, if you donated the deer, they would give you half off the cost of processing your deer. Mm. And so some people were like, well, that's a good deal. Because on the vineyard, it's over $100 to get your deer butchered. Mm. So it's pretty expensive. And so those kind of things, like they could help. Um, w the way I think of it is, like a place like the vineyard, you want more deer taken. Um, and if you can get someone to take that extra deer that they don't need, but it's going to go into good hands um, to those that need it, um, that's that's what needs to be done. So, two excellent questions. Thank you. Yes. You use the word advertised in conjunction with the invitation of individuals to come to your private property and hunt. If you put the word out, there would be more than enough takers, right? Yeah. Um, however, the invitation of strangers on the land with weapons. Um, seems like maybe a more in, I, I, intimate vetting process is needed. So yeah. my question is, is how does one advertise that they would be amenable to individuals seeking to hunt uh, and then go through a process of, I guess, vetting those people and yeah. coming up with a, a real, you know, there's a schedule, this is when you can be there, you know. So it, it would be up to the private landowner. So whoever owns the property, you can put in whatever kind of restrictions you want. It's, you know, you can... So what I would recommend is that you, um, if you haven't had someone knock on your door yet, they will. If you have a property that's, you know, outside discharge setbacks and, and everything, um, and you can start there. Or if you wanted to put up a sign on your property that says hunting by permission only, um, that might, somebody might see that and say, oh, you know, and if you have your information on there for them to, to get a hold of you. And then as to what you want out of a person on the property, um, you know that's that's up to you, but uh, um, but we we kind of when we deal with our hunters, um, I always recommend that if it's a lot of work to get a place to hunt in eastern Massachusetts, um, but if they show up to someone's door and you know dress nicely and they ask permission and they provide a map of where they would like to hunt and what their plan is, it's going to go a lot further than them showing up the first day of the season and you know saying can I hunt back here, you know it's doing their homework and I. That's really up to the hunters themselves, and it's up to the landowners. And um, I, I would say, as as a state agency, I don't think we want to get involved in being middlemen between right. these types of things. Right. Um, and that was the second part of the question. Um, you know, you have mentioned a lot of hunters are using technology on their phones, apps to find out where they are in, in relationship to other structures and things like that. Um, I didn't know if some word advertisement applied to. Is there like a form where you go and say, hey, you know, I'm mean, interested? No, so there's nothing formal um, in the state of Massachusetts, and I don't know many states that have something like that, because I think if you did something like that, I assume you would, you would be assuming some liability yeah. over the process. So if, if you put two people together right. and that person happened to do something bad, it's going to come back on the right. mediating party. So, right. um, yeah, I think, I think the way it has to be is the way it is currently. I mean, it doesn't mean that a, that a town could work within the town to come up with a, a process. Um, but I haven't heard too many people say that they have a place that they would like people to come hunt, but they can't find a hunter. Mm. You know, that's, I haven't heard that before, <laughs> surprisingly. All right, any more questions before we? Well, people can talk to them afterwards. I was going to.
sort of close it off now. Good. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, let, you, let you get on your way and uh, people can do it. Um, before I thank him, uh, this is maybe not the most representative sample here, but as a, the town has a lot of land in town, whether it's town forest land, uh, or it's an interesting example on the map there, that there's town forest next to the trustee property where they're doing it. I'm sort of curious, I don't know what's most representative sample, by raising your hands whether people here are even interested in the town pursuing having hunting on its public land, whether uh, people who would raise their hand, uh, whether this is, okay. <laughs> seems to be a majority of the people, uh, or some people voting twice. Uh, <laughs> I would say bull hunting. I don't know. I don't know. I feel the same though. Yeah. Okay. I like to travel the whole distance. Did you want to say something as part of the town uh, forest committee? Yeah. yeah. I don't know how many people know it, but the town forest has opened up the, the uh, what do you call it, Rocky Narrows in combination with the trustees of the reservation for bow hunting this year. And it's going to go all the way until December 31st because it's only bow hunters. So uh, I don't know how many hunters are in there. I have had some phone calls from people that want to hunt. So I'm not in charge of picking the hunters. The trustees are. They have a guy that's doing it. <coughs> quarry checks. Um, police are all checking the, these guys' licenses. And, uh, you know, we might have other lands. I don't know. This is a this is a test you to have to see how it's going to go. Yeah, for the sake of people who don't know this, I assume this is the property here. Oh, so it's the town property is actually being opened up this year. Yeah, this is what this, okay. I thought most of this is town with Rocky Narrows. Area there. It actually uh, goes from goes from the railroad tracks all the way around the corner to the to the uh, the river, bordered by um, Forest Street. Um, yeah, Forest Street, Lake Street. Yeah, you see his own big hunk of land there. That area was also colored yellow on one of your slides that estimated deer population. Oh, is that one of the ones that we surveyed? Oh, yes. We'll get, a, we'll get a copy of these maps out for you and put them on the uh, town website. The Conservation Commission so we can deliver this. Um, okay, so, so it is one that we, we did a survey and found it. It looks like we we so gave it a ranking of about four. That there's been deer hunting there for several years because of the trustees. So it sounds like the trustees just opened it this year. Yeah, I think this is the first year. Oh, so the trustees, the trustees have had it for three years. Three years? Yeah, they've been all, they, they've been, the land was all donated to the trustees. Mm -hmm. They did it two years, and then this is the third year. This, is, this will be our first year. And I want to say the survey took place there in 2016 is well, when we did that browse survey. I think so, yeah. So that was a few years ago. But, but even, you know, I don't think you would see, a forest is slow to change, right? So I don't think you would see immediate impacts to a forest after, you know, a, a hunt like that. Unless you, unless you took half of the deer out of the population, which is probably didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, it'd be nice to know we don't know the yields that the, uh, what they've got the trustee. It'd be interesting to find out how many deer we're actually yeah. taking. Um, and I don't know if that's probably the 70 that you have for sure. But we're it would have been counted in that, seven, in that total, yeah. Probably not a lot. I mean, it's, that's a little piece of property. Um, well, so we will pursue it because also the Conservation Commission has other properties that were showing up on the other map. Um, Okay, I'd like to thank David. Uh, You're welcome. Happy to be here.